So we're going to get started. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. And welcome to this side event that is organized at the occasion of the 65th session of the Commission on Narcotic Drugs. Um, so just to answer the question in the chat, yes, this event is going to be in English. It's going to be recorded, so you'll have, um, you'll have a, a trace of it afterwards. You'll be able to share it. And it's also going to be transcribed on the CND uh, blog. So my name is Marie Muget. I am the Head of Research and Communications at the International Drug Policy Consortium. And today we're going to focus on issues related to the criminalization of people who use drugs and efforts to establish decriminalization models in Nordic countries. So the event today is organized by the Norwegian Association for Humane Drug Policy, FHN, IDPC, and Correlation European Harm Reduction Network. I'd like to start off today by expressing our solidarity for our colleagues, friends, and people who use drugs in Ukraine who are facing a devastating humanitarian crisis right now and unacceptable levels of violence, repression, hostility, and human rights abuses. And I think all of uh, my fellow panelists and co-organizers can uh, yeah, accompany me in strongly condemning the invasion of the country by the Russian Federation. <clears throat> so coming back to our topic today, over the past few years, um, there has been mounting evidence on the harms associated with the ongoing criminalization of people who use drugs all over the world. This can include mass incarceration, police violence, racial profiling, <clears throat> high rates of infection of HIV, hepatitis C and overdose deaths, a huge level of stigma and discrimination against people who use drugs and other blatant human, human rights violations. And this is the reason why more and more countries are moving towards the decriminalization of people who use drugs. This policy has been endorsed by 31 UN agencies and uh, in the UN system common position on drugs, and also in the UN AIDS global AIDS strategy for 2021 to 2026. In terms of reform, over 50 jurisdictions in more than 30 countries around the world have already adopted some form of decriminalization and many countries are currently considering moving in that direction. In Nordic countries, the debate is advancing and it's advancing pretty fast. In the past couple of years in particular, we've been hearing quite a lot about Norway and efforts uh, to decriminalize drug use and possession at national level. And so it's in this context that we really wanted to bring these discussions here at the CND again, um, to try to understand the state of the debate in Norway, but also in other Nordic countries, and talk a little bit about the potential progress towards reform. So today we have great panelists with us. Um, if you have any questions for any of them today along the way, please ask them in the Q&A section of the Zoom, um, but you can also use the chat. So feel free to use both and we'll track them, and hopefully we'll be able to have a bit of time at the end of the event for answering questions. Uh, but if not, we'll also be answering live in the chat and in the Q&A in writing. <clears throat> so our first speaker is Veronica Honkasola. Uh, uh, Veronica is a youth uh, researcher. She has a PhD and she is a member of the Parliament of Finland. Uh, so Veronica, we're really happy to have you with us today. And you will tell us a little bit about the situation in Finland and the political atmosphere towards decriminalization. So Veronica, you have the floor. Thank you so much, and it's my pleasure to be here today. I will tell a little bit about the Finnish uh, context. Um, so I am a, a, a MP in the Finnish parliament since 2019. And, and for me, my background is in academic youth research. And, and my main themes as a parliamentarian uh, is related to human rights issues. So my, my point of view to, to this theme today is, uh, is also the human rights perspective. Uh, shortly about Finland, uh, Finland's drug policy is prohibitionist, uh, both serious drug offenses referring to drug manufacturing, trade and trafficking, as well as the use and possession of drug is illegal and punishable. 
And this is something uh, uh, that uh, at least the citizens of Finland uh, uh, have a positive to, uh, attitude towards the change to, to decriminalize. Uh, one year ago in the parliament, we had actually a citizen initiative that um, that wanted to to go toward the, the decriminalization uh, of the use of, of cannabis. Uh, but as a MP, I must say that the the attitudes inside the parliament are very very conservative, and we are very few who are actually talking for this harm reduction and and human rights uh, in connection to this. Theme. So it's actually at the moment very hard to have these discussions. And when, for example, this citizens uh, initiative was handled in the parliament, I was the only one in the session who was defending the, the initiative. So this tells something about uh, the, the atmosphere at the moment. So outside the parliament, especially uh, among the young generation, the attitudes are much more liberal. And also uh, the, uh, the scientists and the academic field are strongly for this uh, decriminalization and also strongly for that our drug policy must change. This doesn't work at the moment. So alongside the prohibitionist policy, harm reduction drug policy is often mentioned, emphasizing in national health perspectives. And the most well-known measures in, for example, in, in big cities uh, to reduce drug-related harm uh, is, uh, is uh, health counseling, uh, which is provided to drug users, included needle and syringe programs, et cetera. But at the moment, there is a huge uh, need, especially in the big cities, for more services and also for a change in, in the drug policy. And in Finland, the Ministry of Social Affairs and Health is responsible for the coordination of drug policy. And Finland's drug policy is based on international drug treaties, national legislation and separately prepared drug policy documents. But at the moment, for example, we have a very progressive government in many, many perspectives. But this uh, question on, on decriminalizing uh, is not mentioned in the government program. And several government parties ha have already quite strictly said that they will not, uh, they are not for the uh, decriminalization. So sadly, I don't know that if we have like now we have the most pro progressive government you can imagine in Finland. Uh, so I don't know what kind of government we need for these uh, changes to, to happen in the Finnish society. Uh, uh, there has been a, a, a lately a quite big discussion in the beginning of, uh, of the year about the initiative that the city of Helsinki, which is the capital of Finland, the city of Helsinki made an initiative to the government that the, uh, the legislation should be changed so that we could at, at least try this kind of operating rooms, which are actually functioning at the moment uh, in Norway, Norway and Denmark. Uh, but the attitudes towards this kind of piloting was also very negative. The, uh, the minister, minister, when I made this kind of uh, written uh, question to the uh, minister, she answered that this is not going to happen because it's not in the government program. So this tells also uh, something about the atmosphere between the, the big cities and, and the government or the state because in the big cities, uh, we have more, I would say, experiences with these uh, questions. And actually Helsinki made quite a big report on this issue on the operating room, which was also scientifically based and was very positive towards that the government of Finland uh, should make this possible, at least to try. But so this was um, uh, given a negative answer from the from the government. So the primary goal for the rooms is to reduce mortality 
uh, by providing a safer environment for injecting drug use and by educating in-room clients on safer uh, rooms. And one goal is to guide people to use drugs more safely. That is uh, not by injecting in the operating room, substance testing has been enabled and information and support for quitting drugs and seeking help is provided. And this would be, of course, very important because we talk about very marginalized groups uh, uh, also in, in, in Finland. And maybe maybe our experts from, from Iceland and Norway and, uh, will tell us something about these operating rooms also today. That would be nice. Maybe something about the drug-related deaths and also why these operating rooms would be so important is that uh, based on research, drug deaths are on the rise in Finland and other northern European countries. And statistically, drug mortality in these countries is already the highest in the EU. And this is something that concerns especially young adults uh, and, and young, young men. So this is a very topical issue at the moment in, in Finland. Uh, but it seems that even we have a lot of uh, like evidence-based facts uh, uh, on our side the atmosphere is so conservative inside the parliament that actually it's not about uh, it's not about helping the people uh, in in practice but it's more about uh, that the politic uh, politicians want to show how uh, morally uh, right they are and how good persons they are so that's so sad because uh, Many parliamentarians, they are not even interested in, in like uh, looking at the research that we have on the moment or looking at the hu uh, big international human rights organizations like Amnesty International, how they have changed also the po their policy towards uh, drug, uh, drugs. So um, this is a very, uh, uh, I would say, a struggle uh, that we have to, of course, keep on going every day, but it doesn't go fast uh, forward. But what I did also, since I'm a member of the Nordic uh, Council, uh, I also made an initiative there uh, with my group uh, that we would gather information more about the Nordic countries and how, uh, and also to get more information how how the, the drug policy could be more human rights based and, and how we could also uh, share information and ma make the drug policy more progressive uh, within the Nordic uh, countries. So this is something that is handled in the Nordic Council at the moment uh, and it will come to the session later on. So we will have also this kind of big discussion on drug policy, Nordic drug policy also in the Nordic Council, which I think it's uh, really uh, important. Uh, I don't know how much time I still have uh, left. If you could conclude in one minute, that would be really okay, great. Okay, I will conclude then uh, very sh uh, shortly. So uh, to tell it uh, briefly, Finland's uh, drug policy has been uh, like highlighted by control uh, uh, and, and, and the criminal law. And, and actually, if we look at the usage of, of cannabis for medical uh, reasons, this has even become more stricter uh, uh, within the few uh, years. And, and this is also very, very uh, sad. And, and actually, I'm on this issue also at the moment. I'm making a, a, a written question to the minister about this as well. But I feel that the, as, as the attitudes of the population and the citizens are changing towards a more liberal uh, uh, drug policy, there are a lot of people who support the idea of operating rooms, for example. There are a lot of people who, who support the idea of decriminalization. So I think that the change will happen some, someday. But there is a very big contradictory between the parliament and, and the population as a whole. And, and also that the, 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 the parliamentarians, as I said, they, they don't have that much like uh, 
evidence-based uh, arguments at the moment. So, yes, I could say that we are taking these mini steps uh, uh, towards a more bro bro progressive drug policy, and, and that uh, we can see also in the Helsinki CP initiative and, and also the citizen initiative that gathered 50,000 uh, uh, signatures. So uh, that was about uh, Finland very shortly. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Veronika. It's really great to get uh, updates from Finland, just to understand what the state of the debate is about. Um, it's really good that there are, you know, at least small steps and, you know, the, the safe consumption rooms, obviously there is, yeah, there is tons of evidence all around uh, Europe and worldwide. Um, so hopefully, you know, things will move forward, but it's, it's really encouraging to see some members of parliament like yourself who are leading the charge on drug policy reform. So thanks so much for all your work. Um, I will now turn to our second speaker, Arit Knutsen, who is the founder and leader of the uh, Association for Human Drug Policy, FHN, and he will give us a bit of an update on the state of the debate around decriminalization in Norway and the efforts, the untiring efforts of his organization to promote drug policy reform and in particular decriminalization. So, Arit, you've got the floor. Thank you so much. Marie. And uh, as Veronica said, we have a drug consumption room. And last week, we got the heroin assisted treatment in Norway. Um, in February 21, a conservative government in Norway suggested a model for decriminalization. And I remember so clearly when I was talking about this at the side event here at CND last year, we were awaiting the opposition's response the very same day. And I said then that it was so exciting, it was a thriller. And even though the opposition did turn the suggestion down and later on form a government, it still is a thriller. Due to the findings of the Drug Reform Co Committee, the previous government's proposal and the debate that followed, changes have come in motion, both in attitudes and practices that we didn't even foresee. It all started by a majority of the representatives in parliament making it clear in December 2017 that they wanted to transfer the reaction to drug use from justice to health. Civil society was the driving force behind this reform and was strongly included in the process. The slogan, support, don't punish, was finally embraced, but unfortunately with different understandings of the word support. The slogan for the Norwegian drug policy reform was from punishment to help. And some under understood this as decriminalization and others understood this as a policy where punishment is replaced by treatment to stop using drug treatment. So what happened during the discourse what that drug, uh, was that drug users were divided into three constructed groups young and experimental drug users, adult recreational users, and people with severe drug dependence. The majority of the parliament thought that they should replace punishment with treatment for persons with severe drug dependence. But they opposed decriminalization as such because they still thought that we should maintain the criminal responsibility for young experimenting users and adult recreational users. The logic behind this thinking is that young people don't know what's for their own good, so they must be forced into a control-based follow-up with urine tests and conversations for up to a year to avoid punishment. And if drug use is again detected, punishment must again be considered. And they think that adult recreational users must bear the burden of punishment because they should take the responsibility for the problems that the illegal trade makes. And they think that those with severe drug dependence should be considered as so sick that they are not liable but to be put in a category with children and mentally disabled, and therefore they should not be punished. So the government's drug policy reform was turned down because of these, in my opinion, stigmatizing attitudes, this political abdication of re responsibility, 
and this unfortunate construction of groups of drug users. Even though the parliament did make some changes, for instance, from now on, less serious drug offenses shall be deleted from the criminal record after three years, and the Good Samaritan law was implemented, which says that one shall not be in risk of being punished for drug use or possession when people call for help in situation where someone is in danger, like for instance in overdose situations, so that they will no longer hesitate to call for help. But after this, there has also happened a lot of other changes. Drug testing of students and pupils is finally settled as against the law, and therefore the practice is finally stopped. Also, an old tradition with police bringing the dogs to schools to find drug users among the pupils and to drag them out to arrest and to have them kicked out of school has finally come to an end. And finally now, it sparks an outrage when people hear that those who express a wish for a more liberal or humane drug policy are being harassed by police and child welfare services and so on. There, there are several things that is happening that shows that the attitude to, in the society is slowly shifting in a way where the criminal response is transferred from people using drugs and over to those who are treating drug users bad. And one of the more exciting changes is that the police now are forced to change the way they treat drug users upon arrest. During a hearing at the uh, parliament in March 21, the main opposition to reform, police organizations and police representatives warned that decriminalization would rob them from their tools to prevent drug use. What they meant about their prevention tools was to take urine samples, search cell phones, and search homes when suspected drug use so that they could find who provided them the drugs. The attorney general reacted strongly and then wrote a letter to the police explaining that they do not have the authority to search to use such privacy infringing measures if suspected drug use. And now this uh, search practice is a subject of investigation. Also, you, or Norway's human rights institution has reacted on this practice, stating that it seems to be a violation of both Norwegian laws and the European Convention on Human Rights. In my view, one of the most interesting things that has happened is that the court system itself had started to reducing penalties in drug cases. In some cases, changing sentences from men months in prisons to a few weeks suspended sentence. The reason behind this seems varied, but one of the main ones is that if all parties in parliament agree that people with drug dependence should not be punished but help, how can the court system continue to punish? Within the court system, it has also been expressed that punishment for drug use is pointless. After, and five days from now, March 22nd, the Supreme Court will decide whether criminalizing people with drug dependence is a violation of the Constitution. And there's a great chance that they will come to the conclusion that it is. Uh, on one hand, some say that the parliament cannot have a policy without equality before the law. So therefore, we, must, we cannot decriminalize just for some. On the other hand, some say that we cannot criminalize people with drug addiction because the majority of the parliament is against it. And therefore we cannot criminalize other groups of drug users either. And another important question that is raised is who is to decide whether a drug dependence is severe enough so that they won't be punished. In addition to all this, five political parties at the parliament have suggested a rematch for the drug policy reform. So the groundbreaking debate is still ongoing and the municipal authorities in the capital, Oslo, are working to get permission to have a local pilot tryout for decriminalization. So this is where we are at the moment. When the big debate about decriminalization started, people's eyes were opened 
different parts of society began to evaluate itself. It gave birth to rethinking what had been considered as right and wrong for decades. So to conclude, the debate about decriminalization is not something to fear, but an opportunity for growth and human compassion. And believe me, the situation, it still is an ongoing thriller. Thank you so much, Adil. And it's, it's fascinating to see you guys continue your work in, in advocacy and see the debates moving forward so much and so fast in Norway. Uh, fingers crossed for early April and uh, we'll be following you. Please let us know how it goes um, and uh, hopefully that will unblock the situation. Um, so there are already a few questions for our panelists in the chat. So if you guys want to start answering those at least in writing and hopefully we'll have a bit of time at the end. Um, if there are other questions or comments or uh, statements of support, feel free to put them in the chat. In the meantime, I'm uh, very happy to give the floor to our third panelist, who is Henrik Tam. He is Professor Emeritus of Criminology at the Department of Criminology at the Stockholm University. And he'll be telling us about Sweden's drug policy and how criminalization has exacerbated harms for people who use drugs in the country. And that might already answer one of the questions from the chat, actually. So, uh, Henrik, you have the floor. Oh, Henrik, you're going to have to unmute yourself. Right. There you go. Perfect. I'm not in picture, but should I speak without being in the picture? You, you, you are in the picture. We can see you. Okay, I, I cannot see myself. Good. Uh, the Nordic Research Council for Criminology a few years ago sponsored a working group on drug policy. The question was what direction the drug policy of the five Nordic countries has been taken given the changing policies in the surrounding world. The result of the working group was published a few months ago as open access with the title Retreat or Entrenchment Drug Policies in the Nordic Countries at the Crossroad. The purpose of the book is not primarily to analyze the effects of drug policies in the Nordic countries. It does, however, contain a number of indicators that can be used to illustrate the effects of drug policies utilizing the variance between five countries that are similar in history, structure, and culture. It then shows that Sweden clearly has the most punitive policy among the Nordic countries. The fines for possession of cannabis are the highest. The prison sentences for aggravated drug crimes are the longest and the number of drug crimes reported by the police are the most extensive. In addition, the country is the only one among the Nordic countries that use tests by force about the liquids for establishing consumption of drugs, which is in itself criminalized. These measures could then possibly be accepted if detrimental use of drugs had diminished. However, Sweden has the highest number of drug-related deaths among the Nordic countries, and also ranks among the highest in the rest of Europe. Surveys of the number of persons with a problematic use of drugs were ended shortly after the turn of the century, but two decades before, it showed a doubling of the number of cases. Not only are the results of Swedish drug policy negative in terms of curbing harmful drug use, the costs of control are also substantial. And it's interesting that these costs are almost never debated in political and uh, public uh, discourse on drugs in Sweden. The urine tests, and they are more than 40,000 per year, means a violation of a central principle in law that was brought up by my Norwegian colleague, and the states should not punish acts directed against the person, her or himself, if no one else is hurt. The criminalization of consumption as such also produces a very high number of crimes and criminals. 
close to 7 million crimes per year in Sweden as estimated by the National Council for Crime Prevention. The results from the tests have shown an increasing number of false positive. And in the case of children under 18, around 50%. And the question can then be raised, what it does to the trust in the police when a child is taken by force to the police station on a false suspicion. The stop and search by the police for establishing drug consumption is discriminatory. It will be conducted more in poorer areas with many immigrants where fewer among the young used drugs, according to surveys, then in richer areas with ethnic Swedes, where smoking cannabis is more frequent among the young. This is again according to a study by the National Council for Crime Prevention. At most, almost one tenth of all police officers have been engaged in trying to combat drugs, primarily for use. The question could then be raised if this is an optimal use of the police force when the police and political leaders complain about the shortage of police officers for fighting gang related shootings, which is now maybe the most central issue in Swedish politics. These shootings are to a high degree connected to conflicts in the drug market. Another question could then be raised if there are other ways to regulate the drug market that could decrease the shootings that now results in a very high number of killings. The increasing purchase of drugs for personal use on the internet could be one way. However, it has been met by proposals by the government for increasing criminalization and increases in penalty scales for uh, drugs for um, consumption. Means of coercion to be used by the police have traditionally been most restrictive in a democracy like Sweden. Such means have now been introduced and expanded mainly with reference to the threat of drugs. Secret wiretapping increased four times from the 1970s to the 1980s and only justified by drug problem. And recent debugging has been legalized if there is suspicion of serious crimes and again, narcotic crimes are central to leg legitimize bugging. Sentences for drug crimes some years ago passed the number of sentences for theft that historically has dominated conviction statistics in Sweden. More than one fourth in prison are in for drug crimes and half of the inmates are classified as having a problematic use of drugs. And the question can then be raised if this is the best place for doing something about harmful use of drugs. Sweden has internationally claimed that it has pursued a successful drug policy relative to other countries. Neither in terms of reducing the detrimental effects of drug use, nor in terms of the costs of controls is this true. Let me then, however, finish this bleak picture <laughs> with that there are some signs of a change. The debate has changed markedly in the past three or four years. Uh, most of the youth parties are in favor of decriminalization and three parties belonging to the center right actually have demanded legalization of cannabis. Two years ago, the parliament demanded from the government an evaluation for the first time, an evaluation of the Swedish drug policy and a zero tolerance for much drug related deaths. Up to today, the social democratic government has refused to do anything about that demand from parliament. Thank you. Thank you so much, Henrik, for this. And uh, yeah, it's a uh devastating to see how slowly things are moving in Sweden compared to other countries in the region. Um, but yeah, at least there is a little bit of movement within the parliament that will create an impetus, hopefully, for, for reform. But uh, thank you for that presentation. I encourage you all to have a look at the book and, uh, and yeah, hopefully learn more about uh, Henrik's research. 
Um, so let me now introduce our next and final speaker, Svela Joanna Stotir. Uh, she's a harm reduction specialist and advocate. She will talk about the milestone which leads to the which led to the recent shift in politics and public opinion relating both to harm reduction and to decriminalization in Iceland. And as always, any questions or comments, please put them in the chat or in the Q&A. And to our panelists, there are a few questions for you in the chat if you would like to take a look and start answering them. Bella, you've got the floor. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, thank you. So thank you so much for inviting me to come and organize this event. Um, as many of you know, there's been a, a, a lot of uh, improvement when it comes to the situation of people using drugs in Iceland and especially, especially the people who are struggling with prob problematic drug use. What I would like to do uh, here in this event is just to um, go a little bit over um, sort of uh, the recent years and what led us to uh, the situation we are in now, which is uh, quite positive. But um, in 2021, uh, a population survey conducted, conducted by the Social Science Research Institution of the University of Iceland showed that 60% of respondents were in favor of decriminalization of drug possession for personal use for adults. Two years earlier, in 2019, the same research showed that 33% of the respondents were in favor of decriminalization. So in two years in Iceland, the support for decriminalization of drug possession had doubled, which is massive. So what I would like to do a little bit now is to go over and sort of analyze uh, a little bit what happened in Icelandic society and what kind of advocacy led to this major shift in public opinion. And to start with that, I want to start by mentioning uh, the first harm reduction service in Iceland, which opened in 2009. We were very late compared to uh, other European countries, and especially in the Nordic countries, Iceland was uh, very late of establishing harm reduction approach and harm reduction services. But in 2009, um, the first harm reduction program in Iceland was uh, founded, uh, which is a mobile needle exchange and nurse clinic called Fruragnir, and is run by the Red Cross. With this harm reduction service, the word harm reduction was introduced to Icelandic society for the first time. And before this service, uh, the main discourse in Iceland around drug use was primarily focused on abstinence only approach, prohibition, and all the language around people who were using drugs was often quite uh, judgmental and dehumanizing. With this project, Fragner, a new discourse uh, came into Icelandic society, which uh, uh, helped to uh, make the public understand the importance of harm reduction way more. In 2010, uh, a harm reduction approach was implemented in a shelter for homeless women in Reykjavik, which is also read by the Red Cross. These two harm reduction pro projects, the needle exchange service and the shelter for homeless women, were the foundation for harm reduction advocacy in Iceland. So the advocacy for harm reduction started with these two programs. And through many of the staff and volunteers in these programs, um, the advocacy uh, for humane approach and the importance of harm reduction managed to spread to the general public, to the social and uh, healthcare service providers and institutions. So slowly by slowly, years with years, uh, the life condition, condition of active drug users in Iceland and people experiencing homelessness in the country got increased media coverage in mainstream media. Through this media, 
uncovers the awareness of, of psychosocial factors and trauma in relation to problematic drug use increased. And with that understanding, more people became empathetic and supportive for harm reduction and pros. And this was one of the key factor is to try to educate the public and the service providers of this correlation of how drug addiction develops. Because with that, we managed to gain uh, an empathetic um, understanding um, of people experiencing drug problem in Iceland. Um, and so with this constant advocacy from these harm reduction services and local grassroots groups, for example, Snarrotin Rotin, and the, the uh, massive advocacy of the, the uh, Pirate Party in Iceland, the harm reduction approach became more accepted by the local government of Reykjavik City and the healthcare institution, which meant that the service under them uh, started to implement harm reduction approach to their programs. So all this foundation work that came with the or original harm reduction services in oh, Iceland, cool. and the local grassroots groups and the pirate party and et cetera, et cetera, paid the way for a new approach in Iceland in relation to drug use and, and in, uh, in uh, how we should uh, uh, treat or approach problematic drug use in Iceland. Um, and through all of this, it made it possible uh, to take the next step in Iceland and bring the discuss, a discussion into the parliament. And now I'm going to describe a little bit um, the legal process for the decriminalization bills and the bill for a safe, con safe drug consumption room. Um, I don't know if you know, but uh, great news. Uh, the 10th of March this year, uh, one week ago, the uh, first safe drug consumption room was opened in Reykjavik and is mobile and is run by the Red Cross of Reykjavik. We started to talk about this in 2015 and seven years later, we have it running in the city, which is absolutely great. Um, the bill for drug consumption room was, was uh, introduced to the parliament in 2020 and now two years later, it's open. It's run by the, yes, the, the Red Cross in collaboration with the Welfare Department of Reykjavik City. Uh, when it comes to the bill for decriminalizing possession of all drugs for personal use, uh, that bill has been introduced to the parliament three times. Um, the first bill was introduced in 2019 uh, by nine MPs, and in total there are 63 members in the parliament. It was uh, a, a representative uh, five of the eight political party and was uh, led by the pirate parties. But the pirate party has been the main kind of advocacy inside the parliament for uh, reform um, in uh, drug law. The second bill of the decriminalization was introduced by the Minister of Health in 2021. And at the time, the health minister was a member of the, the Green Party or the left Green Party. These two bill, bills did not pass. And now in January this year, the third bill for decriminalization uh, was introduced uh, by a, uh, an MP in the Pirate Party. So we have to see where that goes. But what is so important and interesting uh, by uh, bringing in this bill to the parliament is that it opens up uh, a public debate in Icelandic society, uh, a 
about drug related issues, which opens up the idea of uh, a possible uh, reform or alternative approach. Um, so all of this, what has been going in on inside the parliament with the decriminalization bill, the uh, bill passed with a safe uh, drug consumption room, and all this um, strong grassroots foundation um, has led us, I would say, so quickly to uh, the point where we are today. And that it is incredible that in such a short, short time, I mean, we, we founded the first harm reduction service in 2009, and now 2022, we see in uh, research that 60% of people living in Iceland support decriminalization. I mean, for me as a harm reduction advocate, this is very impressive. And uh, there are a lot of people to think but sort of my conclusion in this is that the reason this major shift in public opinion happened in Iceland is, first of all, rooted in strong grassroots foundation. That is the foundation. It comes from the original harm reduction services, the local NGOs who were constantly educating, advocating, and uh, talking about the importance of harm reduction, uh, new approach, uh, humane approach, and also uh, in a com combined with the reason that Iceland is a very small country. There are not many people who live here. So the advocacy um, in Iceland is easier than in many other countries. There is a, a, a good access to media, uh, to local governments, and to MPs. It is not so difficult in Iceland to uh, be capable of going to the media or to meet the politician. And all of this so managed to uh, make it happen that uh, now in 2022, uh, majority of Icelandic population support decriminalization. So my hope is that um, this year we will probably, or I hope so with all my heart, that uh, the bill for decriminalization will go through this bill or the next bill. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bella. It's it's really wonderful to see all the changes that are happening in Iceland. And uh, yeah, same thing, fingers crossed that it will go through this year. Um, one, one question that was in the chat, actually, um, and that could go, I think, to, to all of you. Um, the Norway and Icelandic examples do show the power of uh, engagement of academia, of citizens, people who use drugs, harm reduction service providers, and local communities in pushing for reform, both for harm reduction and decriminalization. So how, how could these groups play a similar role in, uh, in countries like Finland and Sweden to, to push for reform uh, in the coming years? So I don't know if anybody from, from the panel would like to take on that question. Veronica, would you like to go first, maybe? Yes, thank you very much, and 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 thank you uh, all all for all these presentations. It was really interesting. Um, I think also in Finland, as I answered in the in the chat, uh, the role of the civil society and the NGOs and and experts in this field is uh, like really important, and and they are the key of of the the political change. Uh, the Swedish uh, Swedish expert mentioned also the the political youth parties and and we can and the role of them and, and as well and in Finland we can see that actually their attitudes are are much more liberal uh, than their uh, the main uh, political party. So I think you have to try to affect on many levels directly to the parliamentarians to the media uh, to get the like the civil uh, public discussion going on all the time and then uh, of course the political parties are uh, they have a big role for example my party 
the left alliance we are going to have our uh, uh, meet party meeting this summer and actually we will we don't have a policy yet towards decriminalization but i think this will be a very big uh, theme in in our meeting our congress meeting this summer so yes uh, i think that the grassroots level and the civic society is, is in the key role here thank you veronica i will ask uh, henrik to take the floor and then svela <clears throat> Yes, so this is based on the analysis that we are making in, in the book. There is a quite interesting change, and maybe particularly in Denmark, that it's not represented here, that uh, those, the recreational user the, the, the is, is now becoming more criminalized. And this is done partly in a new liberal uh, frame of reference where he or she could choose to take drugs or not to take drugs. And also the construction, particularly this really from the social democrats as being a class issue where the middle class will smoke and thereby cause the shootings in the poor suburbs. And that was brought up by my Norwegian colleague. So I think the inroad in Sweden is, and that I think also was clear in Svala's uh, presentation that uh, use the Swedish or the Nordic welfare state concept to where you take care of people who have problem, a problematic life situation. So that is the inroad, I think, primarily, but we should be aware of this actually changing in an opposite direction when it comes to the temporary smoker, the recreational user. Thank you. Thank you, Henrik. Sala, would you like to react to that as well? Yes, I just wanted to, um, I agree so much on Henry. I, I think that um, what uh, Nordic countries have uh, is that we are uh, proud to talk about our welfare state. And uh, I think from this approach, uh, we can um, talk about the importance of um, that the welfare state should be for everyone, not also people who have problematic drug use or do not have housing. And this is something that you can work a lot with on a government level, is that we need to include everyone, not just some people. In my experience in Iceland, because uh, Iceland is a small nation, um, to tell personal stories of people is very valuable. And to connect with uh, people through media or um, education with personal stories is something that reads people's heart and build up empathy. And in my experience, to build up empathy in the public in Iceland was the key factor. And this is why we started uh, effectively just to talk about the psychosocial and trauma connection to problematic drug use. And when that sort of managed to be general in the mainstream media, the, I felt this kind of shift that people said, ah, we are a welfare state. These are people who need support and help. We need to do something. Because when we have this old school thought of brain disease model, or this is their fault, it's very hard to reach people's uh, heart and that they're willing to take steps. And local government in Iceland now recognize that if you're going to support people with some kind of drug related issues, you need to have harm reduction approach because it's in general public now, this is the evidence-based approach and this is what you should do. This is the right thing to do if you're following. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Vela. And uh, I think it's uh, actually quite wonderful to finish the event on these words. Um, thank you so much, all of you. I wish we had more time because there are a lot of uh, questions now popping up in the Q&A, but unfortunately we're already five uh, minutes past. So we will have to close the webinar uh, and allow you to continue following the proceedings at the CND. Thank you so much to my wonderful panelists. Thanks so much to the organizers. 
Um, and we hope that this has, uh, this has enabled you to learn more about what's going on in Nordic countries right now. We will keep an eye on all the reforms that are currently happening and hopefully keep pushing for reforms, sharing evidence, sharing personal stories, uh, and make sure that uh, we continue constructive dialogues with, with our governments. Thank you so much. Have all a lovely day and hopefully see you next year face to face. Thank you, everyone.